problem here is that either Samsung knew about these issues and decided to forge ahead with shipping a $2,000 device to customers despite them, or somehow Samsung inexplicably didn't know about these issues that only took reviewers a few days to discover. But let's be clear though, Samsung is a multi-billion dollar company. There's no way that there wasn't a single decision maker within the company who didn't know about these problems and yet proceeded anyway towards launch. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. If you're new, Geared Up is your weekly look at the latest in the world of consumer electronics and gadgets. We've got a few highly requested things to talk about this week. First up, we're going to be talking about the upcoming Apple iPhone 11. Later on in the show, we'll be talking about Mac OS 10.15, which will be announced at WWDC next month. And in the main story of the show, the most requested segment this week is the fallout, the sudden delay of the Samsung Galaxy Fold and the story behind what happened with what was to be the first smartphone with a foldable display released to consumers. So that's what you can look forward to on this week's episode of Geared Up. Let's get started by talking about the iPhone 11. Now that we're in May, we're basically in the time of the year every year where people start asking me about the next iPhone. Should they buy what's out now? Should they wait? Is something better coming? When is the next phone being released? Now, Apple works like clockwork. As I said, we are in May. Today is May 2nd as I'm recording this. And what that means is we are about four and a half months away from the release of the next iPhone, which should be seeing some pretty substantial improvements, especially as it pertains to the cameras. So first things first, if you need a brand new phone right now, if your phone broke, if your phone's not running well, and you can't wait. Phones that Apple selling right now are, they're great. If you're an Apple user and you wanna to upgrade to a new iPhone, you can pick up an iPhone XS, you can pick up an iPhone XR, you can pick up an iPhone XS Max and you'll be pretty happy. If you're not in as pressing of a situation, if you can wait four and a half months, you can either get the same phones I just mentioned, but at a cheaper price when Apple drops the price alongside the new models, or you can pay full price for the newer versions and get the latest and greatest features. Well, by the way, as an aside, news came out earlier this week that the iPhone XR is dominating smartphone sales in the United States, which is very interesting to a lot of people because people were assuming that since the iPhone XR is the entry level iPhone, it wouldn't do as well as the XS um, and XS Max lines. However, with the exception of last year with the release of the iPhone X, Every single year that Apple's released multiple iPhone models. So this would be starting with the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Every year, the newest, most inexpensive iPhone model is always the best selling iPhone model as well. So the vast majority of people, they want the new iPhone, but they want to pay as little as possible to get the new iPhone. So this year, the iPhone XR is that least expensive model, even though it's not as feature rich. It's got the LCD display instead of an OLED display. It's got one camera instead of two cameras on the back, etc. Since it's the most inexpensive, that's the one people are gravitating to the most. But let's talk about what we're going to see coming in September. The rumor mill starts kicking into high gear about four to five months prior to the announcement and release of the next iPhone. So we're right in that season right now. And the first thing that we're seeing is that cameras are getting a big upgrade. The entry level follow up to the iPhone XR is actually going to get a dual camera instead of the single camera that it ships with currently. So around back, Apple's not going to be selling any iPhones that just have a single camera anymore. So dual camera on back. Around front, we're going to see an upgraded, I believe, 12 megapixel front selfie camera as well. And that's going to be for the successor to the 10R, as well as the iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Max or whatever those phones end up getting named. So same upgraded front camera across the board. Now around back on the iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Max, rather than the dual camera, that we're used to currently, we're actually gonna see it upgraded to a triple camera setup on the back. So triple camera, what does that mean? You're gonna have a wide angle lens like you have today. You're gonna have a telephoto 2X lens like you have today as well. Or at least I believe it's gonna be a 2X lens. Some people are saying it might go up to 3X for uh, that secondary telephoto lens. And then there'll be a third 
ultra wide angle lens as well. And with three cameras on the back, Apple's going to be able to do way more in terms of visualizing what the camera is seeing, which should also improve things like augmented reality when using it with one of the newer iPhones. Of course, we're just talking hardware here. We do not know any of the software tricks and upgrades that Apple will be doing to the phone, that Apple will be including with the phone, that we're going to have to wait to see this September when they announce the new models. One other hardware change, we're going to see a new mute switch on the iPhones, which I don't think we've ever seen Apple change the mute switch on the iPhones since the original released in 2007. It's been the same front to back mute switch. So if you move the switch closer to you, closer to the display, then it's unmuted. And if you push it towards the back of the phone, then it's muted. That's how it works today and how it's always worked. Apple will be switching to a mute switch that goes up and down the side of the phone. So it's similar to the mute switch that was on the iPad a few years ago. It's a circular shaped mute switch. Push it up towards the top of the phone and you're unmuted. Push it down and it mutes itself. I'm not sure why they're making that change, but they are making that visual change to the mute switch. Another question I've been getting about this year's iPhones is will it have 5G or will it be a 5G version? And the answer to that is no. Apple will not be releasing a 5G iPhone in 2019. You may have seen the settlement that Apple reached with Qualcomm a couple of weeks ago, which is going to allow Apple to tap into Qualcomm's knowledge as it pertains to 5G modems. Apple's been partnering with Intel over the past couple of years and Intel has been having trouble building a 5G modem that Apple could use. Apple doesn't want to fall behind in the race to 5G. We're already seeing some companies put out 5G phones here in 2019, but it's not going to be ubiquitous until next year. Apple needs a partner that can give them a 5G modem, and it seems Qualcomm is the only one that can do that. So Apple had to settle. In fact, in Qualcomm's earnings, they reported that they should be receiving about $4.7 billion dollars from Apple as part of this settlement. So expect to see a 5G iPhone in 2020. That's my guess, at least Apple obviously hasn't made that official, but we're not gonna see it in 2019. All right, coming up after the break, we are going to go through the saga of the Samsung Galaxy Fold. What happened? I'll be taking you through the whole timeline from teaser to announcement to reviews to delay. That is coming up next right here on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. Big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. And if you're interested, you should check out my other show that I do with National Car Rental. That one is called Technically Speaking. You can watch it over on the nationalcar.com control center or over at youtube.com slash nationalcarrent. That's a show where I talk about all the best tech that is optimized for travel. So whether you're a business traveler on the go or you're traveling for leisure, tech can make things easier. Tech can make things more efficient. Tech can make things more fun as well. So be sure to check out Technically Speaking, again, nationalcar.com control center or youtube.com slash nationalcarrent for all my travel gear recommendations. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. And now on to the story of the week. This is the fallout from the Samsung Galaxy Fold delay. Or this may be the most requested story in the history of Geared Up. I've gotten so many emails and DMs about this. People wanted me to talk about this one this week. So this is it. Let's get to it. Samsung wanted to be the first smartphone manufacturer to launch a foldable smartphone, and that phone is the Samsung Galaxy Fold. They showed off the device in a dimly lit room in late 2018, stating they were working on a foldable display. And in early 19 at the Samsung Galaxy S10 launch event, Samsung opened the show with a full reveal of the Galaxy Fold. The Galaxy Fold was set to go on sale to the public six days ago, this past Friday, but several reviewers who received the Galaxy Fold early experienced issues that were critical enough that Samsung had to delay shipping. So what happened? Let's dive into the incredible story of the Samsung Galaxy Fold from announcement to delay. First, back on November 7th, 2018, at Samsung's annual developer conference, SDC, in San Francisco, the company showed off a prototype of a device with a new foldable display type. After dimming the light so that the only thing you could really make out about the device was that it had a small outer display, 
and a large inner display. The presenter held up the phone and unfolded it to applause. Samsung called this the Infinity Flex display, but didn't announce a name or date for any device that might use the technology. Samsung did say, though, that it was going into production and they'd have more to share soon. The fact that the device was revealed in darkness, though, should have been red flag number one. Next, January 2019, CES. At the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Samsung focused on televisions and home appliances rather than following up on the folding display technology. They showcased the wall modular television, which lets you build out a large display by piecing together a bunch of smaller displays. Outside of foldable screens, Samsung was still showing off their prowess in other display tech as well. However, people needed to head over to the LG booth if they wanted to take a look at a rollable OLED television. It wouldn't be until the following month that Samsung would be ready to reveal its folding phone. Next, February 20th, 2019, Samsung Unpacked. Instead of being shrouded in darkness, the Samsung Galaxy Fold is revealed in an amazing opening to the event. Not just renders of a device on a screen, but even a real life demo with an actual functioning Galaxy Fold smartphone. Sure, it had a silly, very small, off-center outer screen with huge bezels, but it also seemed to deliver what Samsung had promised just three months prior. A smartphone with a foldable display, running Android, that worked just like anyone would expect it to. Now, the biggest surprise that unpacked was that Samsung announced that the release date would be on April 26th, just two months after the reveal. Most people, including me, expected this to be a preview of a device that would ship maybe in the fall of 2019 or even in the spring of 2020. So getting the device just two months later was a huge deal. Another surprise to most people was the price tag, $1,000. $980 for the Galaxy Fold. I personally expected the device to cost between $1,800 to $2,000. It's the first in its category and it can't be cheap to make. Now, typically after these press events, we're able to go into a hands-on area and check out what was announced. I was there when the Fold was announced alongside the rest of the Galaxy S10 line and afterwards, there were no Galaxy Folds to touch in the hands-on area. In fact, there weren't even any Galaxy Folds like behind glass or anything that we could just take a look at. It was just the Galaxy S10s. Galaxy Fold wasn't there. Red flag number two. Then in mid-April, Samsung began to send out review units to select media. Samsung releases a video showing robots folding the Galaxy Fold over and over, promising 200,000 folds before the device would start to break down. Initial impressions from reviewers are positive with most praising the new form factor and how nice it is to have something akin to a small tablet in their pocket at all times, having the screen real estate to run up to three apps at once. Then a few days later, things started to take a turn for the worst. Of the small number of review units out there, at least four of them failed almost immediately. Mark Gurman of Bloomberg reported that his screen was completely broken after two days and then determined that it was because he removed what appeared to be a plastic screen protector from the display. YouTube creator MKBHD said the same thing and his review unit also broke due to him removing that same layer. It should be noted, though, that this protective layer looks like a piece of trash when you remove it and that Samsung actually ships removable screen protectors on its other devices. If you buy a Samsung Galaxy S10 today and take it out of the box, it will have a removable screen protector on it. So it's not far fetched to open up a new Samsung product like a Galaxy Fold, see that it seems to have a screen protector on it and want to remove that screen protector. Now, CNBC's Stephen Kovach tweeted a video of his Galaxy Fold review unit with flickering display and an unusable left half of the screen. This was after one day of use, and he said he didn't remove the plastic film from his device. Over at The Verge, they found that a bulge had developed under the folding display of their review unit, which continued to grow until it pushed into the display enough to break it. Verge says they did not remove that plastic film either. Michael Fisher, known as Mr. Mobile on YouTube, experienced that same bulge issue with his review unit, which also stopped working after a few days of use because of it. So that's five Galaxy Fold devices dead in under a week, 
and review devices are typically the ones set aside by manufacturers as the best representation of the product. The problem here is that either Samsung knew about these issues and decided to forge ahead with shipping a $2,000 device to customers despite them, or somehow Samsung inexplicably didn't know about these issues that only took reviewers a few days to discover. But let's be clear though, Samsung is a multi-billion dollar company. There's no way that there wasn't a single decision maker within the company who didn't know about these problems and yet proceeded anyway towards launch. Now, Samsung made a statement on these dead devices released on April 17th, where they said, a limited number of early Galaxy Fold samples were provided to media for review. We have received a few reports regarding the main display on the samples provided. We will thoroughly inspect these units in person to determine the cause of the matter. Separately, a few reviewers reported removing the top layer of the display causing damage to the screen. The main display on the Galaxy Fold features a top protective layer, which is part of the display structure designed to protect the screen from unintended scratches. Removing the protective layer or adding adhesives to the main display may cause damage. We will ensure this information is clearly delivered to our customers. And with that statement, Samsung still planned to ship the Galaxy Fold on April 26th, but then five days later, they delayed the release indefinitely, saying initial findings from the inspection of reported issues on the display showed that they could be associated with impact on the top and bottom exposed areas of the hinge. There was also an instance where substances found inside the device affected the display performance. Samsung then said they will take measures to strengthen the display protection which to me sounds like it's going to be re-engineered either in the display area or the hinge or both. Anyone who pre-ordered the device will maintain their place in line and Samsung says it should have an update on a new release date in the coming weeks. Timing of the new launch should be interesting though since Samsung has the Galaxy S10 5G launching May 16th, just about two weeks away. And they also have the Note 10 launch coming in a few months as well. So they have to find an area to fit in the Galaxy Fold where it won't be competing with these other launches. Hopefully that gave you a clearer understanding of what went down with the Samsung Galaxy Fold. Any questions, of course, send them to me over on Twitter at Andrew Edwards, and we can talk more about this. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about the upcoming rumors for Mac OS 10.15, the next version of Apple's desktop operating system, which will be revealed this June at WWDC. It's coming up next on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up. I'm Andrew Edwards. Let's jump in and start talking about the rumors that we're hearing about Mac OS 10.15. That is the next version of Mac OS after Mojave. Apple's gonna reveal it at WWDC, but Guillermo Rambo over at 9to5Mac has been on fire with the leaks, with the reporting, and the findings in what we should be seeing with both Mac OS 10.15 as well as iOS 13. Now the big one for Mac OS 10.15, and this is something Apple actually mentioned last year, is that UI kit apps are coming to the Mac. Or put another way, iOS apps are coming to the Mac in a big way this year. Last year, Apple released the Home app, voice recording app, the News app, and the Stocks app. And these are apps that they took from iOS and ported over to the Mac. So these four apps are available on Mojave right now if you're running it. You can open these up and what you're basically looking at is iOS apps. This year, we should see more iOS apps from Apple, but also developers will be able to take their iOS apps from the iPad and have them run on the Mac itself. So we're talking about multiple windows, we're talking about split view apps that are resizable, like you can do on the iPad. And this should be very interesting to see, and this should actually be very interesting because there are way more apps for iOS than there are for the Mac. And so all of a sudden we're gonna see a, an influx of available apps to Mac users that weren't there previously, almost overnight. Basically, developers just have to take their app, kind of repackage it. Apparently, there's not much work to be done to get it working on the Mac and then just ship it for the Mac and users will be able to run them. That's the first big thing there. Secondly, we're gonna see other iOS features come to the Mac as well. One of them is gonna be the Find My Stuff app. So on the iPhone, you have the Find My iPhone app, which lets you find your iPhone, lets you find your Macs, lets you find your AirPods if you lose them. That same app should be coming to the Mac as well. And Apple is also rumored to be dropping a tile competitor. If you haven't heard of Tile, it's basically a company that makes these little tiles 
that you can put in a wallet or put on your keychain and throw it into your luggage. And the tile app will then track that physical tile wherever it goes over GPS. So if you lose your wallet, if you lose your keys, if you lose your luggage, you open up the app and you can see where these things are. Apple is said to be coming up with something similar, a physical piece of tech that you can then track in the Find My iPhone app. iMessage, iMessage parody should be coming to the Mac. I don't know if they're going to be upgrading the current iMessage app that's on the Mac or if they'll be replacing it with the iOS version. But we're going to see things like special effects and maybe even the iMessage apps, fireworks, things like that, that you can do in iMessage on the iPhone, but that you can't currently do with iMessage on the Mac. That should be changing. The Shortcuts app is also coming to the Mac. Now, this may only work with iOS apps. We're not sure. I'm hoping it works with both iOS and Mac apps. But this will let Siri do better things with your apps, to control apps, to control scenes, to control multi-step shortcuts. We should see improvements to things like media playback, search, event ticketing, flights, message attachments, and more just from shortcuts for Mac. We should also be seeing screen time for Mac. Screen time is available on the iPhone and iPad, which shows you what you're doing. What have you been doing on your phone and how long have you been doing it? Now the rumor is you'll be able to see the same information on your Mac. So what have you been doing on your Mac? Which apps have you been using? How long have you been using each app? What are your kids up to on their Macs? You should be able to see all that information with the next version of Mac OS. Apple Arcade is coming this fall. We talked about that one a couple of weeks ago. It's Apple's exclusive new gaming service. You pay for the service, you get access to 100 exclusive games that you won't find anywhere else. And those games will work on your iPhone, they'll work on your iPad, they'll work on your Mac, they'll work on your Apple TV. So as part of the next upgrade to the Mac, it will support that Apple Arcade service. Next up, family sharing. We should be seeing a new section in the settings area for managing your Apple IDs and your family sharing preferences. This is nice because currently managing Apple IDs is a chore. You have to find the right website to do it, and it's not anywhere near as intuitive as just having something built in to your Mac. Another big rumor is Apple Watch verification. So right now you can use your Apple Watch to unlock your Mac. If you walk up to your Mac and you have an Apple Watch on, you can bypass typing in your password if it knows that you're there using your Apple Watch. Apparently, Apple's gonna be adding more types of functionality like this so that you don't have to type in your password as much as you currently need to. So things like authenticating a purchase from the Mac App Store or autofilling passwords, if you have your Apple Watch on and you're the one using the computer, theoretically, it'll just do these things automatically because it knows you are you based on the fact that you're wearing your Apple Watch. But let me know what you think. What are you hoping to see in the next version of Mac OS. What are you hoping to see in the next version of iOS, iOS 13? We're talking about that next week as well as the news coming out of Google I.O. All of Google's new announcements should be dropping next week and we'll be going over all those on next week's episode of Geared Up. Hey, if you're not subscribed and you like what you hear, just search for Geared Up, two words, not one in your favorite podcast app. We're in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or really anywhere else you can think of. My favorite podcast app is Overcast for the iPhone, and they just launched something called Clip Sharing. So if you're listening to a podcast and you want to share a clip, it'll let you share up to one minute of a clip to your favorite social media sites, and it'll play that clip right there without someone having to be a subscriber to the show so you can share your favorite moments from your favorite podcasts. Of course, I want to hear from you. You can follow me over at youtube.com slash gear live or twitter.com slash Andrew Edwards or over on Instagram at Andrew. Send me messages. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know what you want to hear on the show. Any feedback you leave me, of course, I'll read it and get back to you. If you like what I do here, consider leaving a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Again, big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. And big thank you to you for listening. Until next time, I'm Andrew Edwards, and I will catch you in the next episode.